Welcome to the Butterfly Effect. I'm Chris Horner. This is stage four of Tour of the Basque Country. 185 kilometers, hilly stage. The main thing to focus on, of course, is going to be the last climb with about 25 kilometers to go. It's a six kilometer climb at over 6%. Most important thing though, the beginning of the climb, the first two kilometers are averaging about 11% on this climb. Now the organizers, when they put this course in today, this was a magnificent course because it makes it very difficult when you have a climb at the finish of the stage with still 10 or 20 kilometers to go to the finish because a GC team has to defend all the way up this climb. And then you always have to have riders with you to get from the top of the last summit of the climb all the way into the bottom of the stage, which always means there's gonna be a lot of excitement. Now, as a professional rider, these stages, like I said, I always focused on a lot. These are more difficult stages than summit finishing climbs because if you're a Grand Tour winner, if you're a one week stage GC rider, a finishing climb is simple. Your team gets you into the bottom of the climb, hopefully partly up a few kilometers, and then you light everybody up on the pedals. Easy peasy, nice and squeezy, right? We all know that tactic. But do the commentators here at GCN understand the tactics of yesterday's race and today's race? No, they don't. And when the racing comes on with about 60, 70 kilometers into the race, it's Nicholas Roche and his commentator friend up there and they're discussing why the tactics were perfect yesterday. I can only assume they watched the butterfly effect because everything they were referring to is exactly what I talked about here on the butterfly effect and how wrong their tactics were yesterday. And they're still wrong, but they're trying to justify their tactics, especially Nicholas Roche, about what a fantastic ride Adam Yates had yesterday. And they're describing his ride as strong, forceful, aggressive, trying to win the stage. That's all true. I do not debate that, Roche. They were fabulous, fabulous attacks, fabulous force on the pedals. Everything there you said is true. What I said is the tactics were ridiculous and they're knuckleheadism. Now, I'll point one thing out to Nicholas Roche. Today's stage is identical to yesterday's stage. They're both over 180 kilometers and the last climb summits with 20K to go on both stages. Yesterday he said Adam Yates' tactics were fantastic. Today he expects on the last climb that all the GC favorites are just gonna ride up this last climb together and finish in in a smooth little peloton of GC favorites there. He doesn't expect any fireworks on the last climb of today's stage. So Roche, yesterday your tactics were spot on, agreeing with Ineos' tactics, and today you're saying you don't think there's gonna be any attacks, yet when you put these two courses, stage three and stage four together, they're identical. 180 kilometers, summit finish, 20K to go, but you don't think there's gonna be any attacks. You're absolutely a knucklehead, Roche. Now let me give you one other example of Nicholas Roche, because I've known him from all the riding days, and that's why I brought up the red jersey here, because in 2013, when I won the Vuelta Espana, Nicholas Roche was riding fantastic. He'd gotten the red jersey at one point in time and lost it early in that year at Vuelta Espana. But now we're in the French stage and it's 220 kilometers. Mammoth stage. We're going to go over the Parasort. Nicholas Roche goes up the road to climb before and he gets a gap on all the GC favorites and he's trying to catch the original break up there and win the stage. Now, when we get on the Parasort and the final little bump to the finish of that stage, I'm attacking left and right trying to get away from all the GC favorites because I'm trying to win the Vuelta. So I need time on Alejandro Valverde and Vincenzo Nibali. When we get to the finish line though, Nicholas Roche comes up to me and he's like, Chris, why were you chasing me? I said, Roche, I wasn't chasing you at all. He goes, no, no, I can see you were on the front chasing. I said, Roche, I'm not chasing you, man. I'm trying to win the GC. So. Roche sees things different tactically than I do as a bike racer. That day in Spain, he thought I'm chasing him, but I'm trying to win a grand tour here. I don't care if he wins the stage. I'm trying to get rid of Vincenzo Nibali, Alejandro Valverde, and Hakim Rodriguez to try to put some time on those guys because we're in the big mountains and I'm gonna lose time in the time trials. So when you sit here on the couch and you're watching today's race, because the race was spectacular from the moment the cameras come on, 
but go back and listen to the commentators because it was a running joke of those guys throughout the stage today about every tactical thing they're telling you that's happening in the race. It's completely wrong. Now, let's get into the racing because there's a fantastic break up the road, 13 riders, and Christian Rodriguez, total energies from yesterday's breakaway stage, he's in there again. Now, he's only about 240 down on general classification, so when the camera spreads back there to, to Yumbo Visma chasing on the front of the peloton, you could tell there's not a big hurry, but they got to be a little careful because it's 13 riders up the road, and we've been told already from the commentators, Nicholas Roche, that today's stage was incredibly fast, the first hour being covered in 52 kilometers an hour. So you know everyone in the peloton right now has some fatigue in the legs, and when you look at that group of 13 up there, you know they're all going to be tired because they've probably covered 1,000 different attacks at the beginning of today's stage, and now they've been out there for a long time with a lot of efforts on their legs. Right away, we're going to see Bike Exchange Gourmet Rider. He's going to take a solo effort here before the next climb starts. It's not going to help him much because he will get, uh, get absorbed on the next climb and drop out the back. When we start going up this categorized climbs, it's 2K long and 11%. So it's a very steep climb, but it comes with about 40 kilometers to go before the finish of today's stage. Up in the break of 13, they start blowing up all over the pieces as it's Bruno Aramay, Victor Lefay, Rubens Guerrero, and Garrett Thomas from Enos. Those four riders are going up the road and they're getting a gap on all their breakaway companions. They'll go over the summit of this climb with about a 130, 140 gap on the peloton behind. After the climb finishes, three other riders will come back on, Davide Formulo, Mori Van Savinov, and Mikhail Echeria. Now that makes a group of seven up there at the front. When they go across the finish line with 30 kilometers to go, the next big obstacle in front of the seven breakaway riders is going to be the last and final climb of today's stage. And it is a hard and difficult first two kilometers at over 11% average. This is a fantastic way to finish this stage here. Behind in the peloton, it's Yumbo Visma on the front when the climb starts proper. But the numbers have gotten reduced because they lost a couple riders before that two kilometer climb started with about 40K to go. And now Yumbo Visma is getting a little reduced in numbers. No panic, Sepp Kuss is there. Jonas Vinigo is there, and of course, Primoz Roglic is there. So they got their three main climbers here on Yumbo Visma to start the climb. Up front, Victor Lefay throws in a big attack in the breakaway of seven there. The chemistry with this group of seven after they crossed the finish line with 30K to go, it wasn't very good. I want to show you one picture and go back and rewind the film. If you look, the rider in the front is standing up and stretching his legs. They really were not gelling and just putting in a bunch of effort before this climb started. So now when the climb starts, it's Victor Lefay Kofidis that's throwing in a big attack. When the peloton reaches the climb, remember at this this point in time, it's Nicholas Roche, the commentator here from GCN, that assumes there's going to be no fireworks on this climb. With 11% climb for two kilometers long, there's going to be no fireworks. Well, Nicholas Roche, you are dead wrong today for certain. You were wrong yesterday's tactics. You are certainly wrong on today's tactics as the fireworks are coming all over the place. First to attack, Pierre Latour, Total Energies, throws in a big attack. Primoz Roglic is on it right away. Then it's Bram Villa, Trek Segafredo. Now the attacks really come when it's Danny Martinez. Enos that throws in a massive attack. Again, Roche, we weren't expecting any attacks. And the GCN commentator, Roche, he's talking about like, I don't understand the tactics here. Let me break down the tactics again for you, Roche. It's 11% for two kilometers and then a false flat that follows it for another three two or three kilometers all the way to the summit of this climb. This is a perfect tactic here. All the bike racers throughout today's stage, from what I've witnessed, all the way to this point in time of Danny Martinez's attack are absolutely fabulous and spot on and the way you should race a bike race. Nothing like they did yesterday in stage three. Now, when they get over the steep part of the beginning of this climb, there's a false flat and that's when the action gets thick and heavy because it's Remco Avnipol. Throwing in a massive attack, the climb's probably only about 4%, maybe 5%. It's not that steep. It's almost a false flat, and the speeds are high. Again, Nicholas Roche, I don't understand the tactics. Why are they attacking here? Why wouldn't they just attack up the steep part? Well, they did attack up the steep part, but the whole reason to attack on this flat section, Nicholas Roche, on this false flat, 
is because when you look in the group, there's only two Yumbo Visma riders there. Jonas Vanigo, Primos Roglic are the only two left, and the group is about 35 strong. Now Quickstep is throwing in attack after attack. Julian Alaphilippe will throw in attack, but he's got to go into the gutter on the right side of the road first. He'll come out and continue his acceleration on the pedals. Guys, this is when I'm getting really excited, if you can't already tell, because when I'm sitting on the couch, this is the way a bike race should be done. When you get on these false flats, guess what? The speed is massive. The rider in the front, so when you're talking about two Jumbo Visma riders, Primoz Roglic and Jonas Vinigo, they're outnumbered 33 to two, and when you're looking at the tax, when you're on a false flat, the speed up there is 20, 30 kilometers an hour. That's how fast these pro riders are. So you know if you go out and ride your bike right now at 30 kilometers an hour, almost 20 miles an hour, and you're sitting on the wheel of someone else, you could feel how good that draft is. That's the same way it is at this moment on the climb because these guys are easily doing 20, and I bet they're doing 30 kilometers an hour with every big acceleration, probably reaching about 40K an hour with these massive attacks from Julian Alaphilippe, the two-time road world champion, and his teammate Remco Evnipol, who are highlighting today's stage four finishing climb for all of us sitting on the couch in marvelous style. Now, just near the finish of the climb before we summit, it's Julian Alaphilippe, Dan Martinez and Jonas Vinigo right now that are the biggest threat. They're getting a gap on the peloton and guess who's chasing behind? You got it. It's Movistar. Movistar missed the move. Moss, I don't understand what you're doing right here. This, you have to jump across to this group. Get someone in that break, but you can't pull the break. I know you have Jonas Vinigo up there, so Jumbo Visma with Primos Roglic, they're going to pull the the same kind of tactics that Wout Van Aert does in all the classics. Send their guys up the road left and right and then hope some other team chases. What happens if another team doesn't chase though? And these three go to the finish line and now they lose the jersey in the sprint time bonuses here to Danny Martinez over Jonas Vinigo. That's a catastrophic mistake when you think if Jonas just controls this field all the way to the top of this climb, then of course you come to the finish with Primoz Roglic still with an 18 second advantage on everybody but Remco Evnipol. But I understand what Yumbo's doing here. I just don't like it. Now, Movistar, what are you guys doing though? You got to jump this gap, Moss, if you want to be in there. You can't pull the number one rider in the world, Primoz Roglic, that's sitting in this field of riders here. Because we all know Primoz Roglic, if you pull him to the line, you're not going to beat him that way. You got to attack him and Movistar missed the move. Now, just before the climb finishes proper, there's a couple other attacks that are brought from Alaphilippe and Remco Evnipol over the summit of today's climb. Up front, Victor LeFay is still solo. He has about a minute and 20 at the summit of this last climb, and he's doing everything he can to hold off the peloton. The four riders behind chasing LeFay, Garrett Thomas group with Bruno Aramai, they are trying to get back up to the sole leader up there, but they're not working well enough together, and they're stuck between the peloton and the solo rider up front from Kofidis. He's doing everything he can now behind on the descent. When it starts proper, it's Kaha Ru'al that's on the front, and they got a little bit of help with Quick Step back there as they're trying to bring this thing all back for a field sprint. With 10 kilometers to go, they got the gap down to about one minute on Victor LeFay. And then with nine kilometers to go, there is a spectacular single crash in the field of GC favorites there as Pierre Latour overlaps with the wheel in front of him. When he crashes, he slides about 500 feet, it looks like. It's amazing how far he slid. Now, folks, I've done this many times in my professional career, as I'm sure other riders have. When you're on pavement like this, going this speed, he's going to get lucky, and it sounds a little bit strange to say lucky, but when you slide like this at this kind of speed, this is normally what helps keep bones from being broken. You lose a lot of skin. It's incredibly painful and you can feel the concrete actually burning the skin because when you slide this long, you can see there with Pierre Latour, he has enough time to get his feet back up underneath him and now he's sliding on his cleats before he finally comes to a slow enough speed that he pops up on his feet, 
grabs the guardrails and you can see him screaming in pain. I did not say it will not be painful. It certainly will. But I would bet and imagine that there's a whole lot less broken bones, if any, when you crash at this speed and slide like this versus if you would have crashed and hit a guardrail or hit some fixed object that just isn't going to move at these kind of speeds. Because you got to believe that he had to be doing at least 40, 50 miles an hour when he crashed because the slide distance was unbelievable and I'm sure if it's anything like I've felt in my professional career you can feel the burning and that's why you see his feet come up underneath him. Now up front when we go back to the GC favorites it's up there Jumbo Visma's at the front. Mori Van Savenoff will swing off hard to the left and then Jonas Vinigo. This is kind of comical right here because Jonas Vinigo, Jumbo Visma, remember there's only two riders in there, him and Primoz Roglic. Jumbo Visma's patrolling the front of this group at this moment and when Mori Van Savenoff swings off hard left, you see Jonas Vinigo. He's like, no, 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 Mori, Mori, come back here, man. He waves over to come back here, man. Get back on the front because I don't want to have to ride the front. I don't want my teammate back there, Primoz Roglic, race leader here at Tour of Basque Country, having to ride, a front, ride the front and then to get attacked with under eight kilometers to go. Come on, Maury. Let's, give you, let's get you back up here on the front. He comes back, does one more pull. And then about 300 meters later, this is the next picture that's really funny. Jonas Vinigo looks over his left shoulder. When he checks over the left shoulder, he sees UAE Team Emirates coming up. And he gives the UAE Team Emirates train there the little hand wave. Come on, guys. You can get up here and do a pull. Absolutely. You could get on the front and work for Primoz Roglic and me because we're only two guys up here. We're almost isolated in this group of 35. Now, 100%, let me make it clear. I agree with UAE team members here. They don't have a GC guy to win, so they got to focus on stages. And they got five riders up there in the front, and one is Dago Ulysses. Now, Ulysses, an old teammate of mine, he is fast, and this is normally how he gets his wins in the big European peloton, is in a reduced group of 35 like this. So when UAE team members get on the front, I am 100% in support of this. Now, they'll start driving, but they're all fatigued. Remember, Formula was up in the front brake when they caught him coming down the descent here. You have Rafael Micah in there. You have my old teammate Jan Polanc. He's in there pulling as hard as he can. Mark Soler is finally not doing Solerism stuff and he's on the front selling out 100% for Dago Ulysses. Now they will start pulling all the way to about 2.5 kilometers to go and now another comical comical air here from one of the riders. It's Bahrain victorious and they come and try to slot on the front here to do a massive pull because Victor Lefay is just under 20 seconds and up the road. But UAE Team Emirates are falling apart. They are hurting at every push of the pedal. And the Bahrain victorious rider does what almost every fresh rider does at this moment. He comes to the front and takes a massive hard acceleration. Luckily for UAE Team Emirates, Rafael Micah comes in here and slots right behind the Bahrain victorious rider as the rider is throwing everything. Caution to the wind, full power to the pedals. But what I got to remind you fans at home when you're watching this, when you're watching the Bahrain victorious rider get to the front, this happens all the time. When a fresh rider comes to the front and this UAE Team Emirates train up there is dying and blowing and gaskets and oils flying out the legs in every direction imaginable as they're trying to catch Victor Lefay up the road, you cannot... I repeat, you cannot, Bahrain Victorious, come to the front of this group and pull 100% after you've been sitting on the whole descent and these UAE Team Emirate riders are no longer fresh. That gap absolutely hurts the legs on Rafael Micah, but he closes it just as he does. What does the Bahrain Victorious rider do? He pulls off after only 300 kilometers or 300 meters of pulling absolutely comical mistake. Make sure you guys look for that stuff in future videos and race videos when you watch a fresh rider come to the front and pull with a rider that's fatigued because it happens all the time. They underestimate how tired the UAE Team Emirates team is and he only pulls for 300 meters. Bahrain Victorious, you would have been a whole lot better off coming to the front doing a really smooth acceleration and then pulling for 500 or 700 meters to try to help the UAE Team Emirates riders back there recover a little bit. Instead, they don't. When Bahrain Victorious pulls off, UAE Team Emirates are rag at this point in time with nuts and bolts left all over the course. And then it's Remco Evnipol with 1.5 kilometers to go. Of course, Quickstep are going to come to the front now and start bringing back Victor Lefebvre 
Lefay to close up the last gap. When he was on the front, when he first took over at 1.5 kilometers, we're going to see him dip his head down. He looks between his armpit and his legs there, and he sees there's a gap back there to Jan Polic. So the Belgium kid, he is smart at this moment. I didn't expect this. I really thought he'd come to the front and just blow this race up because he was pulling so hard. Instead, he looks under his legs. Then we're going to see him look right. Then he's going to look left. He realizes that he's opened up a gap there to Jan Polic, UAE Team Emirates, and Rafael Micah. He'll slow up. Those guys will attach back on. Then he'll get on the pedals and start driving it. With one kilometer to go, Victor Lefay, like I said, is now wrapped up, and Remco Evnepoel is driving it into the finish. With... 300 meters to go. Things get exciting because we're going to see back there Vlasov, Bora Hansgro. He's going to throw in a hard acceleration on the left side and everyone has got a bum rush for the right turn followed by the left turn. It's a chicane with about 200 meters to go. A right, a quick left and Vlasov wants into that chicane first. Vlasov won't make it first because Remco Evnepoel is just pulling too hard but Danny Martinez does. They'll come out of the right turn. Danny Martinez, Inos is in the lead. Now, right behind him, we're going to see Julian Alaphilippe. He's on the inside there of Remco. I was a bit worried about this because Remco is looking left. Alaphilippe manages to slot between the barricades and his teammate Remco Evnepoel, who's fading at this moment. Julian Alaphilippe will make it through. Diego Ulises went to the left side there of Remco Evnepoel. And now, when we look at this next picture, it's the defending champ here at the Basque Country, current race leader, Primoz Roglic. He's in fourth position with 75 meters when they exit the chicane to the left. It's Danny Martinez on the front. Julian Alaphilippe and Dago Ulysses are side by side starting to accelerate. Primoz Roglic, who did a daring move up the inside of this turn, and today's inside tactic worked fantastic as he comes out fourth wheel, starting to throw in efforts on the pedal to try to win today's stage four. Up front, Danny Martinez is still accelerating on the pedals. He's fading a little bit as the two riders behind, Dago Ulysses and Julian Alaphilippe, are doing amazing acceleration. It'll come to the line with a bike throw with Danny Martinez, Julian Alaphilippe, Dago Ulysses, and last year's winner and current race leader here, Primoz Roglic, all coming to the line four across the road. But it's Danny Martinez who takes a sensational victory here on stage four. Amazing job, Enos. Your tactics were fabulous today. Yesterday, nightmare, but today was fabulous. Danny Martinez knew he had to get into this chicane. Remember, it's a slight uphill drag to the line. It's a right, left, technical ch chicane, so it's perfect to go in first. He goes into the chicane first, comes out first, and wins for a sensational victory here at stage four of the Basque Country. Now, there was a little bit of moving around on the top 10 general classification as Danny Martinez now moves into the podium spot for third here on the GC. Pierre Latour, like I said, he crashed and moved out of the top 10. Julian Alaphilippe will move into the top 10 in ninth spot here on today's stage four. Was a fantastic race. If you guys get the chance, watch the whole race from the beginning. Comical errors and tactical mistakes from all the commentators here at GCN on today's stage. But the racing by the riders was fantastic and spot on. If... If I'm being picky here, and I'm just being picky, but if I'm being picky, I would prefer Remco Evnepoel goes and tries to get a gap and races for GC here at the finish of today's stage instead of racing to win the lead out for Julian Alaphilippe because the group of 35 was so ragged here and with Remco Evnepoel being so close to Primoz Roglic on the general classification, I think he could have jumped and possibly gotten a gap somewhere. And I understand racing for Julian Alaphilippe, but in my regards, the way I think GC always comes first. Yesterday, Remco Evnepoel let out, of course, Primo, let out Julian Alaphilippe, and then today he did it again. And of course, he did on Julian Alaphilippe's stage win on stage two. But in my book, I would love to see Remco Evnepoel race just for general classification, especially when Primoz Roglic, Jonas Vinigo, and Jumbo Visma are in a very, very delicate position here, being in a group of 35. They can't afford any mistakes. Remember, this is the first time Ineos have been able to beat one of the two Slovenians, Primoz Roglic or Tade Pogacar, outside of the three time trial wins from Filippo Ghana. 
I hope you guys like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys on the next edition.